the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I have to say, during the reading, uh, during the singing of the glory, I looked over and I had ample elbow room and I looked over at this lot and I, I had a twinge of guilt. Uh, and then when I realized that I represented 50% of the men's choir, it, it turned to dread. So it's, uh, thank you all for supporting us. In our so on Thursday, every Thursday, you all are all invited at 715 to come participate uh, in the bishop service and it's a great service because I have very little if nothing to do with it uh, my only responsibility is to read the gospel and if there's another priest there I hand that off as well so last Thursday and it's a little more informal we read from the sheet that's printed out so uh, uh, it was my moment where I get up and I read the gospel and I started reading the gospel and a, a booming voice uh, much bigger voice than that space needed, but that's my habit. Uh, and all of a sudden, about three sentences in, I realize it's the wrong gospel. So I stop, and Bishop Gulick, who I've known since I was about yay big, says, carry on. So I think it's the wrong gospel. But I, so I start again, and I get through it, and then he looks at me, and he says, Ben, that's the wrong gospel. I said, yes, Bishop Ted, that's what I was saying. So then Dorothy uh, uh, wonderfully runs over, grabs this book, and runs it to me. So I pick it up, the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. And I don't check the date. And I start reading from Mark, and it's the exact same Gospel lesson that I misread over there. Finally, I switch to the right one and read the right Gospel. But for three different times, I ended up reading that Gospel passage that we had just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it stood out because it's not one of the easiest passages to preach upon. It's the uh, rich man coming to visit Jesus. But after reading it three times, uh, it juxtaposed itself against that other gospel. The rich man who comes up with, without any intrusion and just uh, gets right in front of Jesus and kneels and says, uh, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he tells them, you need to obey the commandments. He says, I've done that. And he says, well, there's just one more thing. Depart of all your wealth, give it all to the poor, and then come follow me. Where he hangs his head low and, and walks off. That, up and against this week's gospel, where Bartimaeus screams at the top of his lungs, Son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet. Get out of his way. Can't you see he's going somewhere? Get out. Son of David, please have mercy on me. Leave him alone. Get out of here. Finally, when Jesus says, let him come to me, he throws off his cloak and runs. The only possession he probably has, the only thing that is his, is probably that cloak. And he discards it to go to the foot of Jesus. Juxtaposition. I realize it's not just this gospel up and against that gospel two weeks ago. It's this gospel set amidst the trajectory we've been on for a couple months. From the last time we had a story about Jesus healing a blind man. For over two months, Mark has been throwing us into this attempt to open our eyes. This metaphor for blindness is, has been repeated week in and week out from the disciples. First, Peter saying, uh, exactly, the confession of Peter, I know who you are, you're the Messiah, the chosen one. And Jesus saying, yes, and I'm going to die. They're going to arrest me, they're going to nail me to a cross, and I'm going to die. And Peter's saying, no, that's not how it's going to happen. It's blindness. To the disciples, fighting over who is the greatest, going back and forth, I'm the greatest, no, he's the greatest, he's the greatest. And Jesus saying, you don't get it. It's not about being the greatest, it's about serving the least. To the discussion about children, and the disciples trying to keep the children, the voiceless, the disenfranchised, the person that is not a really a person yet, away from Jesus, and Jesus dignifying them and acknowledging the personhood of them as he says, bring the children, the voiceless, the vulnerable to me. Don't you get it yet? To again, Jesus saying, do you know the cup that you have to drink if you follow me? Do you know where this is going? Still blindness. 
still blindness. As James and John come in begging, can I be the, the one on your right hand? Can I be the one on your left? Can we have a, a, an exalted place at your heavenly throne? Jesus is saying, hey, open your eyes. Do you understand what this is about? If you want to drink my cup, if you want to be baptized into my baptism, you need to be able to carry your cross. You need to be least. You need to serve the least. I came to serve, not to be served. I came to lift up the lowly, not to be exalted. All of this between these two stories of blindness. And then today we have the story of Bartimaeus. As they go into Jericho, a fairly wealthy town, it's where Herod's summer retreat house was, because it was a few degrees warmer uh, than, than the other places. So it was a great place for a summer getaway. Uh, and they've gone into town. And we assume it must have been a successful trip into town because the masses have followed him out of Jericho. And he's walking out of Jericho. And it's not surprising to find a beggar on the side of the road. Uh, uh, certainly it's not surprising to find a sick person on the side of the road. They're not welcome inside the city gate for fear they may infect the masses. And to prop up this behavior, they say, well, this certainly must have been a sin, uh, either of his own or of his parents. So he gets to uh, be uh, pushed outside the city gates. And he, and he waits outside because it's a prominent city. And he figures maybe a coin will get tossed here or there. And I can at least take care of myself, feed myself. So as he's outside the, the walls of, of Jericho, as he's right outside the city walls, uh, as they come out, uh, we know this is the son of Timaeus. Uh, but we know also that he doesn't get to live with with Timaeus, doesn't get to live with his, his spouse if he has one, or his children, or his siblings, because, because he's not whole, because he's broken, he's cast out. And so the disciples who have just heard Jesus say, I came to serve and not to be served, and if you want to follow me, that's what it's going to look like, are with him outside the gates, and the vulnerable, the disenfranchised, the blind, beg to see Jesus. So the disciples, still as blind as they've been the whole time, get away. Leave him alone. Can't you see he's going somewhere? Can't you see he's busy? Don't disrupt this triumphant exit. And he says again, and he proclaims the faith that he knows who this is, son of David, Messiah. Have mercy on him. And I love when you break down that word mercy. It's a beautiful word. It's a rich, rich word. Uh, Bishop Gulick talked about the, uh, it coming from the word for womb, and certainly the, the, uh, the Hebrew version of it does. The Hebrew version of the, of the word for mercy comes from that word for womb, that we are all in the womb together. That to have mercy on somebody is to realize the oneness, the, 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 the brother or sister, the child um, together, that we are all one, that we're from the same womb. That when we have mercy on somebody, we recognize that oneness, that commonplace, that origin. In the Greek, the word mercy, the word mercy comes from the word for oil, for olive oil. Uh, and when we say, Lord, have mercy upon us, Christ, have mercy upon us, Lord, have mercy upon us, we ask that that healing oil be poured into our wounds, into our empty places, into uh, our wounds, that, that that salve would be rubbed in gently, that God's compassion and God's love would touch our broken places and stay there long enough to rub it in and to soothe our pain and our hurt. So why do they always shout, Lord, have mercy on me instead of, instead of make me see? Because what could be more beautiful than the love and grace of God rubbed into our most vulnerable hurt places? mercy. And we say in that prayer of public access that we say during right one, uh, God whose property is always to have mercy. And a beautiful image of a God who understands all of us as from that same womb, as brothers, sisters, children, all from the same womb of God, and also understand whose property is always to have mercy, whose grace pours out like an oil to be rubbed into our most wounded, vulnerable places. So that's what he begs. Please have mercy upon him. Jesus says, like he said to the children, let them come to me. Come here, Bartimaeus. And I think it's, 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 it's fitting that he has a name. We think of how few of the healing stories actually have a first name, a, a, a name attached to it. I think there's a, a reason here. Jesus is dignifying this person. 
He's identifying this is not some hindrance on the way out of Jericho. This is a beloved child of God from the womb of God. He invites him to get up, and he jumps up, he leaps up, he throws his only possession in the world. He comes to Jesus, he says, what would you like? He said, I'd love to see. And he makes him so he can see, and, he, uh, and then Bartimaeus disobeys him. First thing after he's healed, Jesus says, you're free to go, go. And he says, no, and he follows him. He follows him on the way. Just like the rich man goes in the opposite direction, this man casts everything aside. And at the same place where those walls were broken down, those walls of Jericho, now the blindness is shed. We realize he's going straight from there to Jerusalem. This was the last chance for everyone to see, the last healing story before they head towards that triumphant end, before they head to Jerusalem. I just think it's such a beautiful image. Also, one of the things that Jesus does, and uh, the word in our colic today, and it's the word from that uh, Corinthians 1, 13, 1 through 13 that we have at so many of our weddings. And if you go back to the older versions, like the King James Version, uh, love never ends. The greatest of these is love. They use the word charity. And I think over the years, we've forgotten what charity really means. We think of charity being us walking down and handing something to somebody else and then coming back up to our, uh, our, our place of, uh, of distinction. Charity, the same word for agape, love, is getting down, is humanizing, dignifying that person, realizing we're from the same womb, spending long enough to rub the oil into their wounds. When we do ministry, we minister with our brothers and sisters, not to somebody less than. But there's a reason why it's difficult. There's a reason why we wear that blindness so thick, is that it has a cost. C.S. Lewis, and I wrote it, down, because, or printed it, that's how I write down, uh, has a beautiful quote about what it is to truly love uh, in, in, in ministry, what it is to truly love the people that we care for. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one. Not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. In fact, it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. If you give Bartimaeus a name, if you truly believe he's from the same womb, you can't lock him outside your gates. That's why it's so hard for us to open our eyes to see. Because once we see, we have to love. And once we love, there's a cost. We have to let him in. calls us to have mercy, to share that womb, to love, to be that oil that is rubbed into the wounded parts of this world. We've got to stay a bit to do that. Amen.